Good to see everybody back. Now I say back, for those of you out in television, you missed it. They had a birthday party for me in between programs. And I'm not going to tell you out in television how old I am. I've had a hard time convincing these people. But uh, <laughs> anyway, thank you for everything, for all of those of you that were responsible for bringing in the cake. I guess, Ann, did you bring the cake? Uh, thank you. And for those of you out in television, again, we just thank you for everything. Your prayers, your notes, and uh, your financial help. And uh, we, just, we just love mail time, don't we, honey? Boy, we just, we just revel in it. Okay, this is just a simple Bible study, and uh, we're going verse by verse. And if by any chance you want to order this particular program, it'll be in a composite of 12 programs, but it's in book number 55. And uh, the first one, of course, is way back in Genesis, number one, so we've come a ways. And I don't know how much further we're going to go. I told somebody a little while ago, I'd just like to be able to just quit. But uh, I don't think the Lord will let me do that. So uh, we'll just keep on going. All right, 2 Peter, chapter 3. We'll just pick up where we left off. I almost forgot about the clock up there. And uh, I had to end kind of abruptly. But we'll come back to where we left off. Verse 5. For this they are willingly ignorant. <clears throat> willingly ignorant. Not because they couldn't help it, but they don't want to know that the Word of God and the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. In other words, it wasn't a regional flood. It was universal. It was covered with water from one end of the globe to the other. And it was utter destruction. Now, I think most people in their study of the flood miss the catastrophic part of it. And I want just back for a second to Genesis. Uh, and there's just in almost one verse that most of your preaching will totally ignore because it doesn't make for the uh, dramatic preaching material that a lot of people like to use. You know, you've all heard it. The water got ankle deep and a few people woke up and realized, oh, Noah knew what he was talking about. And then it wasn't long, it was knee deep and a few more realized that Noah knew what he was talking about. And then it got a little deeper and a little deeper. And it kept raining and it kept raining and it kept getting deeper. And then finally when they were chin deep, then they started really almost pounding on the doors of the ark wanting to get in and have their salvation. Well, you see, that's not the way it was. It was not the rain that destroyed the population, but it's in this verse right here, uh, Genesis chapter 7, verse 11. And it was not just a gradual rising of rainwater. This was a cataclysmic, immediate destruction. All right, verse 11 of Genesis 7. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the seventeenth day of the month, the same day, instantly, were all the fountains of the great deep broken up, and the windows of heaven were open. So what do you have? You had a cataclysmic eruption of all the powers and the energy from beneath that caused the tidal waves and the floods and everything that destroyed everything, and then, of course, with it, you had the deluge from above. So never, never lose sight of the fact that the flood was an instantaneous total destruction with all of the pent-up energy that rests within the globe. And we know that it's tremendous, the energy that is below the surface. And we see it in, in volcanoes or in an earthquake the energy that is released. All right, so now coming back to 2 Peter chapter 3, the scientific world to this day will not admit to a universal flood. I remember when I taught Genesis in, in our early years on television, and I challenged people, if you ever see a college textbook that gives a definitive account of Noah's flood, show it to me. And no one ever has, and they can't, because college textbooks will never admit a universal destroying flood such as Noah's. And so this is where the scoffers missed the point. They said that nothing had ever changed. The flood changed 
everything. The flood changed that tranquil, tropical, original earth before the flood and just utterly destroyed it and just brought it down to total devastation under the pressure of all that water. And then as the waters receded, according to God's sovereign dictate, we have the planet appear as we now know it today. And for years I've told people, when you drive through the country and you see river valleys, and you see mountains, and you see deserts, always remind yourself that was all formed as a result of the waters of Noah's flood receding from the planet. And we have a complete inversion then of the numbers of square miles of water and land because before the flood it was mostly land mass and only a small amount of water, whereas today we are three quarters water and only one quarter land mass. So the whole thing was totally inverted by Noah's flood and yet these people are willingly ignorant. They will not admit that this cataclysmic event took place. All right, now we can move on. Verse 7, but the heavens and the earth which are now. Now, of course, at Peter's time, the earth is as it is now. The same rivers, the same mountains for the most part, were on the scene with Peter's day as we've got today. All right, so the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word, the word of God, are kept in store. Now, now I've got to go back to Colossians. I'll never finish 2 Peter 3. <laughs> I sure want to today, if possible. I want to get this all in book 55, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, starting at verse 15. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. Speaking of God the Son, up there in verse 13. Who, speaking of God the Son, is the image or the visible physical appearance. He is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn, or before anything was ever on the scene, God the Son was already there. He's from eternity past. Verse 16, for by Him, by the Son, Jesus of Nazareth, as we know him in the New Testament. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, earth, whether they be visible, invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things, everything, were created by him and for him. That's why when I've taught over and over over the years, when they nailed the nails through his hands, those created beings were doing it to the one who created them in the first place. The created beings, those Roman soldiers, were nailing their own creator on the cross. That's what we're looking at. All right, and so Colossians says, for him, by him are all things created. Now here's the verse I wanted to tie in with where we were in Peter. And he is before all things. He's from eternity past. He didn't just come on the scene in Bethlehem. He's from eternity past with the rest of the Godhead. He is before all things. And by him, by the Son of God, by Jesus the Christ, all things consist or are held together. He is the word, now then, of 2 Peter that holds the whole universe together. And if he were to release the power of his word, we'd have instant cataclysmic destruction, which will happen. All right? So back to 2 Peter chapter 3. So the heavens and the earth, which are now, verse 7, by the same word, the consisting power of Christ, are kept in store. He's keeping them intact. Nothing is destroying itself. 
It's all running in perfect harmony by His Word. But He's reserving it, He's keeping it for an eternal purpose out there in the future, and that is what? An utter judgment, see? It's reserved for fire under the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. God's judgment is going to fall again as it did back in the day of Noah, only instead of with water, now it's going to be destroyed with fire and energy. But it's going to happen. All right? Verse 8, But beloved, now he comes back to the true believer, to the Jew believer, and it's apropos for us as well. But believer, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. Now you can took, look at that in several different ways. I prefer to look at it that God can do in one day what He can do in a thousand years. He can spread out over a thousand years what He could do in a day. On the other hand, you can look at it that with God, 24 hours is like a thousand years, or a thousand years is like 24 hours. And so God is timeless. That's the best way to look at it. In eternity, there is no time. I pointed that out several months ago. In eternity, there is no time. There is no five minutes back. There's no five minutes ahead. It's the constant now. And so for God, a thousand years is nothing. This two thousand years of grace is just nothing more than a snap of the finger. And so time means nothing to our sovereign creating God. All right? Verse 9, so the Lord, the Creator, the Savior, is not slack concerning His promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering. His patience is beyond human understanding. So His long-suffering to us were not willing that any should perish or lose eternal life or not gain it, I should say. Not gain it and lose it, but never have it. It's not willing that any should perish, but it's God's will. It would be His desire that all should come to repentance or to a knowledge of salvation. But mankind won't do it. He's not going to force them, but He leaves the opportunity open. And you know, you've heard me teach it over and over. If the plan of salvation required a million dollar payment, the world would work their fingers to the bone to get that million dollars. If it would cause people to climb a sheer cliff five, six hundred feet and get their ticket to heaven, it'd be a line a mile long waiting for their chance. But that's not what it is. It's free. I always use John chapter 10, the door to the sheepfold. I am the door. Any that would come in can come through me. Oh, and then I always ask the question, where's the door to the sheepfold? Up there on that high mountain? Across the river? No. Ground level. It's in front of every human being, every place they go. The door to the sheepfold is open. But they won't take it. They, re they rebel against it. All right, now then we got to keep moving. Verse 10. But, in spite of everything, in spite of all of God's patience, in spite of His mercy and His grace, in spite of the fact that He was not willing that any should perish, but the day of judgment is coming. The day of judgment is coming. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens, the universe, shall pass away with a great noise and the elements, that which makes up matter, they'll melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. Now, it's not going to happen until after the thousand-year reign, of course, but that's all included in the last days. That's why I put it on the board a little while ago, that after the millennium has run its course and we're ready for eternity, God's going to destroy this whole ball of wax. I think the universe. Now, I don't get adamant about that, but I think He's going to call in the whole universe. 
from the same source that it went out in the first place. And then he's going to recreate everything new. Now you see, there's a logical reason. Is there anything that God has created that old Satan hasn't defiled? I don't think so. He has put his fingers of defilement on everything that God owns, including heaven itself. And so in order to start out with something brand new with none of the fingerprints of Satan upon it, he's going to destroy it all and recreate it. And I think that's exactly what Peter's talking about. But it won't happen until after the thousand-year reign and before we slip into the eternal. All right, now in verse 11, Peter is reminding us, if this is the case, if this is the judgment of this universe that's coming, and all the power of God will be exercised to bring it about, seeing then that all these things Things, all part and parcel of creation, these things shall be dissolved. Now, those of you who have had anything to do with chemistry, you'll recognize immediately that these are terms of the laboratory. When you reduce things to solution and you dissolve, these are all scientific terms. All right, so what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation or manner of living and godliness. Well, what's the lesson? If we are living under the control and the love and the mercy of such a God who can not only create this tremendous universe that's beyond human understanding, but can also destroy it and pull it right back from whence it came and redo it, then goodness sakes, why can't we give him his due? But mankind refuses to do it. They treat him like just some Santa Claus or as nothing at all. But Peter is admonishing the believers, we understand whom we serve. We have an understanding of the God of creation. And it ought to promise, uh, prompt us to be godly in our living. Now verse 12. All the while with this knowledge of creation and of what is going to happen to it, we should be looking for and hasting to the coming of the day of God. All part of this last days, all part of the day of the Lord, coming from His first advent to the end of the millennium. These are all wrapped up in those two terms, the last days and the day of the Lord. All right? We shall... Uh, be looking and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, see? And the elements, all of the matter of the universe will melt with fervent heat. Oh my goodness, with our knowledge now of nuclear energy, this isn't hard to believe. All he has to do is release, release the atoms and everything self-destructs with tremendous heat. It's also logical, all right? Verse 13, Nevertheless, we as believers, according to His promise, not according to the prophets now, but to the Word of God, we look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth Righteousness. Now again, I think this is one reason I feel that Revelation was written earlier than most people think, because you see, John writes the same thing in Revelation, and even though the Holy Spirit is inspiring both men, yet I think it behooves us to realize that Peter must have had an idea of what John was talking about so that he could understand as well. Revelation chapter 21. Revelation, chapter 21. Well, actually, slip back to chapter 20. Slip back to chapter 20, so we get, we get the scriptural unfolding. Back to Revelation 20, verse 7. Back to Revelation 20, verse 7. 
And when the thousand years, the kingdom, are expired, it's run its course, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. Now you want to remember, he's going to be locked up all during the thousand years. That's why it'll be such a glorious period of heaven on earth. All right, but when the thousand years are finished, Satan will be released for a short period of time, and he will go out and deceive, in other words, he seduce again the multitudes. He will deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, in other words, from one end of the planet to the other, including Gog and Magog again, which are intrinsic to the enemies of Israel especially. And he's going to gather them together to battle, just about like Armageddon all over again. And the number of these people will be as the sand of the sea. And these rebels now, coming out of that thousand years of a glorious heaven on earth with Christ as an absolute righteous king, these will immediately rebel against the king. They will follow Satan, and they go up on the breadth of the earth and come past the camp of the saints about the beloved city, which is Jerusalem again. But this time, God doesn't waste any time. Fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. That takes care of the rebels coming out of the millennial reign. All right, now here comes the end of time as we know it and the onset of eternity. The devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast, the Antichrist, that world ruler of the seven-year tribulation, and the false prophet are, after a thousand years, they're still there. And the devil is cast in there with them, and they'll be tormented day and night forever and ever. All right, now verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. That's Christ himself now, sitting as judge of all the lost of the ages. And there was found no place for them. Verse 12. And I saw the dead, all the way back from Cain to the last rebel of the millennial reign. And I saw the dead. Now these are the ones we referred to a couple programs back in John chapter 5, where Jesus said that the just will be resurrected and the unjust will be resurrected. All right, here's the resurrection then of the unbelieving world. And they stand before God, and God in this case is Christ, the righteous judge. The books, plural, were opened. The record of everybody's life on earth. And the book, singular, was opened, which is the book of life, which showed the names of the true believer. And all these people will give an opportunity to see that their name isn't in it. And then the dead were judged. Their punishment was meted out according to those things which were written in the books according to their works. That's why punishment will vary in the lake of fire. The sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. They were all brought before this great white throne judgment. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire where, of course, the Antichrist and the false prophet and Satan are already dwelling. And this is the second death, that final separation from their Creator God. Verse 15, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. All right, that ends the whole 7,000 years then of human history as we've understood it. Now, that's why I went back and recapped that so we can come into chapter 21. And now chapter 21, John says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heavens, which I think en envelops the whole universe. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. They melted in fervent heat, and there was no more sea. In other words, the next planet evidently is going to be without benefit of oceans. It'll be a total landmass, if I'm not mistaken. Verse 2, 
And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now this is the onset of eternity. Eternity. Never ending. Never changing. And yet we'll never get bored. You ever think of that? I do once in a while. I think, my goodness, to go from here to eternity? It's going to get monotonous. No end. Nothing different to look to, but don't worry about it. God is going to make it so perfect, so glorious. No, we're not going to get bored. We're not going to wonder, well, when's this going to end? Because it's going to be so glorious, see? Well, then you get on over into chapter 22. We get a little more of this same thing, this new heaven and new earth that's coming. Chapter 22. And he showed me a pure river of the water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God in the land. Now, I don't think this is to be spiritualized. I don't think this is a figure of speech. Because, you see, the same thing happens when Christ sets up the millennial kingdom and he sets up his throne in Jerusalem. There's going to be a flow of fresh water out from underneath his throne room in Jerusalem out to the Dead Sea and will purify it. And it's going to go also back out to the Mediterranean, and on both sides of that river, it's going to be lush. And so we have a repeat of it now in the new heaven and this new earth, and again we have a pure river of water coming out of the very throne of God and the Lamb. See? And so we have a repeat of many things before, but now everything will be all new, no curse, no fingerprints of old Satan upon it, and it's going to be glorious beyond our comprehension. And that's what we're waiting for. That's what we're looking for. And it's going to be here before we know it. Well, uh, once again, in, in verse 2 then, we have the reappearance of the tree of life, which we were introduced to way back in Genesis. And it's not going to appear again until we get into the new heaven and the new earth. <clears throat> Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding.